Hey, it's Ralph and Marcus on the Good Sugar Podcast. On this episode, we go deep into the world of Donald Hoffman and answer the question definitively, do we live in a simulation? It's all on this episode of the Good Sugar Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Good Sugar Podcast. I am Ralph Sutton. And if you're looking on YouTube, it looks like Marcus is standing at something that says the sugar, but it's because he's blocking there. And it's good sugar. He has a green screen and he's very proud of his light and his green screen. By the way, I will say this, Marcus, the light you're using, it is a pretty good even light because there's not a lot of artifact around you or on your head. There's a little bit, but around your body, it's pretty good. Thanks a lot. Good job. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of that compliment. I've spent so much time on on getting this right and you know it's coming my the fruit is finally coming to bear well good i'm proud of you by the way also i got just in the in the interest of pulling back the curtain i got a text not from you but sort of from you it was from the good sugar store saying hey this is marcus from good sugar and that good sugar is running some sort of sale is that right that's right you know i finally got the text messaging uh thing correct using you know the softwares that let you do that and you know, we've collected a lot of cell phone numbers and I'm very careful. I would never text anybody, you know, uh, stupid like, hey, I have 10 percent off. I'm, I'm using it for really incredible promotions that are in the store. And we sent one out yesterday for the first time. And we didn't actually anticipate that because it was a 50 percent off juice and baked goods sale mm -hmm. between the hours of 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., which are generally quieter. Okay. We sold out of everything we had in the store by 11 a.m. Wow. That's right. So uh, it was a very good test. That's really cool. I'm excited for my first check to come in. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I got you your checks in the mail, buddy. <laughs> I'll believe that when I see it. Yeah. So here's the thing. Yes. There are a few different episodes, or I would say styles of episodes that we do at Good Sugar, right? Sometimes, not as often as I'd like, we bring on a doctor and we answer questions that have come in that want, like, specific, your favorite doctor, Mr. Mechanic, Dr. Mechanic, will come on. He's been on once or twice, and we talk to him. I like that you called him Mr. Mechanic. <laughs> Mr. Mechanic. Well, he's still a Mr. I don't know. It's only, it's it's only profession. Name. That'd be, only, if he had a TikTok channel, he'd be Mr. Mechanic, not Dr. It, am I right that it's the only profession that you change the... Uh, you know, the, the uh, prefix, you say doctor instead of mister. I don't think there's any others that you do that with. You mean I like know. officially? Like judge like, maybe. Well, you do a judge or senator. Officers, police officers have yeah, that. I guess that's true. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we have uh, that. Polit politicians, senator. Yeah, I said senator, I, whatever. But it'd be weird. You still say mister. Anyway, then we will sometimes bring on a guest and we do somewhat of a cold of an interview show, right? We've done those a few times. Then it's just you and I bullshitting. Right. And then sometimes... We look at people in the space of health and wellness and we listen to what they have to say. And then you and I kind of literally off the cuff, uh, at least for me, talk about how this person resonates with us and if we can take something from it. We did it once with Jordan Peterson. We made that a two or three part episode. We did it once with uh, back in the day with uh, Sat Guru. We did it with a few others. And so we haven't done this in a while. Again, in the interest of full disclosure, I seldom listen to these types of people. You do far more often than I. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I'm assuming you watch these people pretty regularly, not only for insight, but maybe these things resonate with you and you pick and choose and it helps you mold your philosophy better. Would you agree with that? Um, in some cases, you know, yeah, I would say that I definitely am very grateful for you too, because it's like the Encyclopedia Britannica, the way I use it. You know, if I mm -hmm. want to learn a subject, I'll just, you know, listen to a TED talk or, you know, the TED talk will lead me to that person. And then maybe they have other talks that they did that weren't TED. Um, so it's definitely a learning experience for sure. It's, it's an incredible platform because, where would I get access to all these people unless I was traveling right a, a decade ago or 20 years ago? So that's one thing. The other thing is um, I'm really interested in the venue for myself as a, as a, as a retail merchant. I'm, I'm very interested in having, having the ability to communicate directly with my audience, not relying on, let's say the New York times to write an article 
you know, obviously with YouTube, you're still reliant on their platform, but mm -hmm. everybody has a chance. Like if you have a, if you have a camera, everyone has a chance to be, yeah, it is a, it is a good uh, equal playing field for that's sure. Right. And well, so, funny thing, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I get, I get a lot of great information and then you can cross reference it. If I'm listening to someone talking about something specifically, let's say in the field of physics, I could find their detractor or their na the naysayer and listen to their interview and instantaneously I can compare and it's a question of how smart I am at that time whether or not I walk away with good information. So I think YouTube is great. I'm I, I love it. I'm sorry. You know, it's funny. There's one thing you said that's interesting. Imagine if you're if you're over the age of thirty, I guess you don't know this, but we used to have encyclopedias in our house and right. we would choose to go look at. There'd be a whole <laughs> shelf dedicated to it. There were traveling encyclopedia salesmen. That doesn't exist anymore, obviously. Right. But the information would get outdated. And if you you had a one that was from a few years ago, things would change. That was the business it's, model. It had to yeah, get outdated. It's it pretty wild. So that, I'm sure Encyclopedia Britannica, I can't imagine they still exist as a company. I don't know if they do. No, but. It's the idea, you know, it's, for me, I grew up with technology. I'm at that age. Actually, at my age right now, you can say that my dad had the first self mobile phone in his car in Beverly Hills. My dad had one of the first laptops. It was like this just total garbage. Like if you look at it today, it probably might, you know, I have a, like a, a Casio G shock that probably has more Ram and memory than this, this laptop. But I'm, I'm a product of the, the transition of every type of phone that existed. Right. Start, I remember, I remember having a beeper and then going from just having a beeper to the ones that could give you a text display. Wow. You were, you were, you were cool. riding high with the technology. And then if you remember, uh, the sidekick and you know when when uh, the blackberry was popular so you know i don't think i'm outdated i think the opposite i think i'm really plugged into what's happening with technology and for me you know youtube is a really interesting tool because you know like i could put just dance on and dance with the kids in the living room or you know i could watch uh my news channels or i mean the diversity of wacky shit that i watch on youtube if you looked at my history you would there's no way that you could figure out what the hell kind of a person it was cuz i just watch so many different things that i would never be able to watch uh, to be able right. to learn about if i was just looking in an encyclopedia you know the funny thing is, though, this is the problem, was why I think, you know, uh, I forgot which comedian said it was like 20 years ago. Maybe there was, but it didn't seem there was as many flat earthers as there are now, right? And the problem, I think, with YouTube, and they know this is a problem and choose not to fix it, because there was the whole show about this once, is what's called content bubbles. Because they found out that they used to just care about clicks, but now they care about view time because of ad sales and whatnot, right? And it used to be that anything that would just inside a reaction would get you to click. You know, usually it's for the hate or the anger would get you to click. But what gets you to watch is if it reinforces your current belief. So they give you a content bubble. So if you are a flat earther, I'm using that as an example, all the other videos you see in that right side recommendation window are more and more people talking about flat earth. And right. then that way, you think, oh shit, every single comment and, and video on YouTube is proving me right and it makes you watch more and more. Well, you're never going to be able to take away the the need for an intelligent person who's looking at the information to decide what is right. You know, like if everything they served on YouTube was Nazi propaganda, I would just turn it off. I wouldn't look at it. I wouldn't be drawn in by it. You know, what I like is that Even though there's commercialism involved in it, there's still a democracy in it. You know, there's somebody out there that may have only, you know, 200 views that may be dispelling somebody's science that has 5 million views. Mm -hmm. It's up to me to find it. And then if I look at it, it's, a, it's up to my intelligence level to determine if that person is right. But mm -hmm. the fact that it's there is why it's such a valuable tool because it's really a democracy. Right. I do get that. And I think it is a, the best thing about it is that the barrier to entry is so low that anybody can do it. Right. But then the, the flip side of that is because of that, there's just an awful lot of shit out there. Like my, the line is, it's great that everyone can do it, but it's also terrible. Yeah, that but everyone it's filtered. Can do it. It's filtered. But it's filtered by your 
eyes. I the what what they feed me in my feed, YouTube knows me inside and out. What they feed me, if they put something in my feed that I don't like, I always comment and say, not interested, because I don't want to see more right. of that. And if you looked at my feed, it's frequency, vibration, sound waves, like that's like two thirds of it. It's lectures from physicists. It's a puppet show. Uh, it's anything with a unicorn in it because in the morning when I'm on the train with the baby, you know, sh- the first thing she says when she sits down in the chair is unicorn. It'd be cool if you said there's anything with unicorns in it because I'm sexually attracted to unicorns. That okay, no sexual jokes when it pertains to children because we want to keep that our. Wasn't, that wasn't that you brought the children. All right, so anyway, in Didn't this say, world, maybe something about children. I, I didn't say anything about children. Oh. I just heard that. Sorry. That was yeah. my bad. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so in your quest for YouTube uh, videos that, that tickle your fancy, right. there's a guy that you had mentioned, I think it was last week or the week before, Donald and Hoffman. his name is Donald Hoffman. And can you, as a, as a layman, give me a little bit about what his viewpoints are, at least from your uh, point of view, and uh, we'll take it from there. Um. I'll never forget the first time I saw Donald Hoffman. It was love at first sight. Uh, I found his first interview uh, by accident. They fed it to me because it probably had a lot of the keywords of what kind of stuff that I was looking at at the time was I was very interested in how hearing a lot of uh, astrophysicists and theoretical physicists basically saying that Quantum physics breaks down as you get smaller and smaller. It doesn't things don't behave the way they behave on the macro, you know, mm-hmm. planets and black holes and suns. We pretty ha- we have a pretty good idea of what's going on in the universe right now. We're getting I better at that, but okay. We have a pretty good idea of the four forces that govern the universe: gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic... Mag, uh, there was a fifth one discovered this year or last year, but also the other what? thing is that... I forget what it's called. Well, but, uh, it's, it's, it's debatable whether or not black... I'm uh, sorry, uh, dark energy is actually a force. It, it, well, the, the whole thing is that, you know, I, I don't want to get into a deep science end of this, but 90% of the, world, of the universe is dark energy or dark matter, and we don't understand shit about it, so we sort of understand this 5 or 6%. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's untrue, what you just said. That's not, that's There's not a lot of physicists that are Nobel Prize laureates. I can't cite them. I'll go get it. One guy proved that what's happening in dark matter is it's just waves, waves, waves of energy. That's um, well, something's happening this. there. Me, something me, that something's happening there that we cannot yet describe. Right. And that's where Donald Hoffman comes in. Okay. And so Donald Hoffman is a PhD in neuroscience. Okay, And then you'd find that kind of interesting to think about, well, why would somebody in neuroscience be talking about physics? Well, there's a lot of intersections in understanding the nature of the mind to understanding the nature of reality, right? Because what, what are we using to understand the nature of reality? We're using the mind. So the limitations of our understanding come from mind. Um, so... What Donald Hoffman seems to be to me is a really intelligent person who's able to talk about some of these really deep um, physics subjects that if you listen to the physicists that he quotes talk about them, the layman could never understand it. There's just way too much math. Uh, There's a guy uh, that he always cites, I have to get his name, that Donald Hoffman always cites as saying, you know, he says this, let's say his name is John Smith, according to John Smith. So I went and I started listening to John Smith and I was like, wow, this guy is, you know, he's giving lectures at MIT or the study for, uh, you know, the the Institute for Advanced Studies. He's a guy that works on the the the, the large uh, Hedron Collider that's out mm-hmm. in the, the Midwest. And he could talk about what what those experiments are proving. Some of that stuff is just too hard for me to understand. So Donald Hoffman in these interviews that I've listened to, it makes it much more approachable as a, as a, as a subject matter. And when he speaks, I can, under, I understand that he, there's an overlap where he is now talking about what ancient philosophies talked about, about the nature of the universe and consciousness, except consciousness and old philosophy didn't have math. 
to prove the rigorous nature that you have to be very rigorous in your science. If I want a guy like you to believe, I can't right. just give you some you know, philosophy. So what Donald Hoffman is doing with his team and his research students is they're trying to prove that space time, which is everything that you can think of space time, right? Can you, it's everything that space time includes mm -hmm. doesn't happen first. And then that, creates consciousness. So space-time is not the fundamental thing. What, what they're saying is that consciousness itself is the fundamental thing that creates space-time. Can you can So you are you that? implying that without humans or without life... Without consciousness. But without life on Earth, there's no, there's no space-time? That's right. Uh, that's, that's 100%. A hard, that's, a, that's a hard that's, pill to and, swallow. And, and there's a whole league of physicists that are saying it absolutely. They're saying that they're using the term space-time is doomed as a concept. It has some very important and elegant structures in it that we can use, but it breaks down. And it breaks down specifically on a quantum level at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 45 seconds. All of the laws of physics go By the away. Way, ironically, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is also the size of your penis. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy you found the joke in there. Um, so what's interesting is that um, there, there's a lot of people that talk about this stuff. This is like a new frontier. And there's, there's even people that are winning like... Nobel Prizes for discovering things that sort of support this concept. Donald Hoffman is just a, an incredible mind, a person who really articulates this in such a way that if I said that if you listen to some of his interviews three or four times, you would at least find them very interesting and say, well, how can I disprove him? Who's the naysayer against him? Even Albert Einstein would talked about things that are being discussed in quantum that he didn't like. They, you know, they called it spooky, spooky physics. Right. So that, so the idea is that in physics right now, there's been plenty of studies that prove that particles behave differently when they're being observed by consciousness. It right. has to that be when they're being measured. Yeah. They're, they're take these physicists are taking it to the next level and saying that, um, you know, even with quantum entanglement, where two particles that are entangled can be on the opposite ends of the universe. Right, and they defy uh, the laws of right. physics in terms of state. It travels faster than the speed of light. Thank you. Uh, something like that. What we're deriving from this is, what, what the way that Donald Hoffman puts it is, he just uses the metaphor of virtual reality headset. You're given a headset at birth. It's actually a cheap headset, as he calls it. Because it only sees, it only sees, you only see an experience that which evolution deemed vital for your survival so that you can procreate. Well, that's true. I mean, just like we only see the light spectrum, we don't see x rays, we don't see infrared. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I get that. Team. That's fine. Okay. But so that, so, so let me now, just say, contr contrarily, I know of another theory where. They believe that the uh, on that microscopic level that we're talking about that there's in the string theory, it's a theory of wormholes that are allowing these things to pop in and out of existence right. from one end of the universe to the other. Hence, no need to actually defy the speed of light, but it's allowing the wormhole th the hypothesis. Right. Of all these good, good, that's what string theory is based on, I believe. And I can well, be fucking it up. But. I, you know what? You're fucking it up really bad, and. Um, you know, uh, I would fuck. You know, by up. the way, I don't have a full doctorate yet in in. Uh, no, I'm going to say, listen, it's not just doctorate. You got to be able to talk. You got to be able to bullshit your way. All these physicists that I listen to, every one of them gets put in a corner, and they always have a, a way to get out. Mm -hmm. And that's usually by quoting some other genius. So, well, by the way, the, be the best quote ever <laughs> is that Charles Darwin said, "Once we see things on the microscopic level, all the answers will be solved." But boy, was he wrong. Well. Here's here's the thing that uh, this is the reason why I find Donald uh, Hoffman to be so elegant is because he loves the theories of evolution because they explain to his group and their theories. They're putting math. They actually put math behind some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it, it explains why 
we only can see a, a very, very small glimpse of the nature of reality because um, evolution of our biology doesn't see it fit that you yeah, I get that. You know, and, I mean, your brain is amazing in that it shows you your reality that you need. Right. I get that. I so totally am saying, on board with that. His, what they're saying is that it's the opposite of what the, um, with the, uh, we'll start off like again with classic physics, starting off with Newtonian physics, Einstein. Okay. It's the opposite that space time is not fundamental. Consciousness is fundamental. That consciousness gives way to space time, not the reverse. They say in, in, in terms of neuroscience, the brain doesn't exist. It's the observation of the brain that makes it exist. He does we, I have no neurons right now. It's all an illusion. And, and so he's able, and I'm not yet, because I have to keep listening more, he's able to tie that back into something practical and useful. I'm not. Like, I couldn't then tell you, well, why is it good that you know that? I'd, I'd be like, well, I don't know. And that's um, my, by the way, my number one argument with flat earthers, not to bring it full circle, is, yeah. all right, I'll agree with you. The earth is flat. Now what? Like, how does that change our lives? Yeah, but you know what? You have to draw the line because what Donald Hoffman says is that his research is where everyone isn't looking. Everybody's saying that this is how reality works, right? And yet there's a lot of things that are that are remain unanswered. And according to these guys, they will remain unanswered as long as space-time in their philosophy or their principles is fundamental to the universe. And so what Donald Hoffman is doing is using his PhD and his tenure in the, you know, his very prestigious uh, university to explore something that is um, very, uh, very out there. Mm -hmm. It's a very out there concept. And um, I'm not, well, I will say this, all yeah. concepts that become reality, like Galileo was out there when he first showed everyone a telescope. It was crazy. You know, he got killed for it. So I understand that sometimes the people that break the eggs are going to be vilified until there's proof. So I get it. Right. That's fine. Right. So, uh, so, the, so what I like about Donald Hoffman is that as his inter some of his interviews are like two hours long and I, and I've managed to get through one of them that I liked. I've listened to it nine times, 10 times wow. already. And it's interesting. I, I keep picking up new things. So the one thing I find really interesting about him is that I know that he's a deep meditator. Okay. And in his interview, he says he's been meditating for 22 years. And he said it was very difficult for him because as an academic, it's all about the mind. It's mm -hmm. all about having better thoughts. And he said that, you know, he was having trouble sleeping. And so he started meditating. And I could tell that it's because of meditation that he is able to go very deep into a lot of these concepts because I don't. I don't think you can just do it with the with the with the awake mind that's solving problems. I mean, you could be a genius and a brilliant person, but at some point, you're going to have to go inside and tap into collective consciousness, which is embedded into the very fibers of your existence and to what consciousness is. He's saying that we're all just agents of consciousness, but we're all connected to the same one consciousness. What is that? I'm gonna fuck up the word, but the, the all the uh, the trees. So is it my mitochondrian? What the fuck is it? Where all the trees are interconnected or something like that? Like they're all like if one tree in the forest needs water, they somehow get it all to that tree. Like my, mitochondrial, I think it's called. I don't fucking know, but it's something like that. Where all right? So we're not geniuses. Don't make fun of us. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Okay, so this is, I believe, a clip from a podcast called the Robert Edward Grant. And, I, uh, and I haven't, I haven't seen mycelial network. Neither one of us has seen it, so okay. uh, we're we're at a, a fair disadvantage that uh, no one's got a, had a chance to research. Well, you've you've spoken to the, you've, you've listened to this guy before. I've never heard a single yes. word of it. No, his, but so I you're... gave you li listen, motherfucker. You, Whoa, you your IQ is a good sixty points higher than me. If oh. I gave you the assignment to say, please, over the next month, just listen to this six times. I know that you would derive more intelligent perspectives than I would. It's very nice for you to say. Yes. Right, let, let's play it, Brian. And this is, again, from Robert Edward Grant's podcast. It's Donald Hoffman on Do We Live in a Simulation? Let me just ask you a very blunt question. Do we live in a simulation? Well, 
let me say the answer in 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 this in a little way. I'll hedge it a little bit. It's, it's, my first answer would be: if you take evolution by natural selection seriously, mm -hmm. suppose we, we we and we ask the question: what is the probability, given that theory, that our our senses were shaped by natural selection to show us true properties of objective reality? What is that probability according to the theory? And the answer is the probability is zero. Very, yeah, yeah. It would kind of be in the category of where you would expect it for something like chaos theory or something. It's not, it's not going to happen. It's like me taking apart my watch and putting it in a bag and then shaking it. And what's the probability that's going to come back as a watch if every piece has already been taken apart? So let me. So here's what I'm taking from this. He is saying that because natural selection has shaped our senses that there's no way to think that we aren't in a simulation is that no. what i'm deriving or am i no. misunderstanding what he, that? what he said was that and they have math that proves this if you look at all of the let me rephrase it <clears throat> the chances that natural selection would decide that showing us as humans more accurate portrayal of the nature reality is zero that if we saw the nature of reality the way it's actually happening we would not survive well i understand that but the, how does that prove that we're living in a simulation that, that, you're mis mistaking it this does that doesn't prove anything that's just the first part of 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 a longer list of questions that's not that doesn't prove anything okay the, he's he we're uh, actually I would say that the clip is not really the best clip to highlight the thing that I brought out the most of is that he's saying that consciousness is fundamental and from consciousness we have space time versus space time being fundamental and then space time creates consciousness. Mm -hmm. So that's a much broader topic. Right. What he's trying to say, what he's doing is he's creating the argument that we are in a, we we are given a headset. He's using that the headset as a metaphor. The headset is your entire, all your senses, the body that you live in. Right. We're just calling it a headset because it makes it easier to conceptualize. Know, to, I get it. Yeah, conceptualize it within the headset. <clears throat> evolution is in the headset because head evolution doesn't exist either because it's just a construct of space time. Which is a construct of consciousness. Well, because you but, could keep you could keep backdating it, saying like if this yes. is because of this and this because of this, then obviously, right? There's, there's got to be a start point for that. Right. But I get it. so so he's there saying, is no, he's saying ahead, that evolution would never. Evolution has chosen to show us a very tiny glimpse of the nature of reality because that's all we need to survive. And I could give you an example. No, but I, by the way, you don't need to convince me on that. I'm on board no, with that. I, I'd like to get, I would like to illustrate it, a, one example okay. of that. Okay. We have eyesight and you already have an understanding of what we can see. Evolution has decided that human beings don't need telescopic eyes. Mm -hmm. We we didn't we didn't develop ability to look up into right. the cosmos and be able to see you know a storm on on Jupiter right there's no that have no value here right. the other thing that you can say is it's obvious that we're standing in a giant limitless soup of atoms and molecules and we don't see them right we don't see them so that's that's the nature of reality is we just don't see that yeah, much I'm so also on. by the way they so that's used to really be this what he's saying there. There was a great TV show years ago that showed you how it was called Brain Games, and it would show you how your brain fills in reality over and over again, right? So it would right. show you like you can't like your peripheral vision, for instance. Very often, your brain just fills in what it assumes should be there, based on your own experiences in life or whatever you've seen before, and it will make sense to you. Like how many times we get tricked with like a a, a triangle on the screen that's not really a triangle because your brain fills in the empty right. lines. Because your brain needs to make sense of your reality. I 100% agree. We all, like, even though we both can agree that this thing here is black. Right. What I see is black and what you see is black may be different. Right. But we both know that this is how our brain right. interprets black. There's no way to know for sure if we see it the same way. Well, he and uses, I get that. He uses the game... Uh... That uh, car chase game, Vice. Uh, what's it called? You know, the, my, um, 
Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. Okay. So he says, imagine that uh, you're in, we're all inside of Grand Theft Auto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that mean I could start going to beat up hookers? Because yeah. that's a big part of that so, game. He he talks about this argument really well. He says, if I'm if I'm holding uh if I'm holding a gun, um and I drop it and now I'm not holding it anymore and I you know I turn around the corner, you as another player can approach the same gun. So that's aha, see it exists. Mm -hmm. But he's saying no, it only exists inside of this virtual reality that's been created by evolution that we're all part of the same. The, the, we're all part of that same thing. Um, I mean, so, I agree. With you. This part I have no problem with. So, this is so, not. So it, then I'm not. I don't do a great job here. I'm not really trying to. I, I, I should draw some kind of uh, conclusion of why I find this stuff really interesting. Um, well, the first thing is it the, the idea that consciousness is fundamental. Font consciousness is the creator of mind. Fits yogic thinking for one it fits uh the Tao de jing you know lao tse wrote this right so mm -hmm. it really changes it, it really helps to create a more modern day practical perspective on how we create the world that we live in and if we if we can somehow take off the reality headset and see deeper into the nature reality what else would we be able to create for the good of our lives and for other people. If we, well, if, I mean, you know what I'm, I'm on board with all of this. I just think it's how do you, for, for to use his metaphor, how do we pull off the headset? How about that? You die for one. <laughs> well, it's the truth. Right? That that's actually what it is. So what what he said beautifully, which comes from ancient Buddhist philosophy, is to die before you die. Which is the practice of meditation. What it should be doing is quieting your mind starting off with the most difficult task which is the first phase of meditation is getting the ability to show up for it which is just the discipline then mm -hmm. you go through all kinds of troubles with concentration distraction and then boredom boredom is mm -hmm. such an incredible fuel to take you in to the obsessions of the mind just to get well, that's out what of I, that took to quote as we bring up a lot on the show neil degrasse tyson he always says that the greatest minds came up with their ideas when they were living alone with no netflix and no right nothing to uh you know distract them they had nothing but themselves and that's when the best ideas come from that's right and that's then right. also to piggyback on what you said about die first we have said this a hundred times on the show how often is it that people have to go through shit before they start really looking at life differently? Like they have to usually hit some sort of metaphorical rock bottom before they start having an enlightened look at the world. And I've often said, I hate that so many of the people we bring on had to go through the fucking firestorms of hell before they were able to look at the world differently. Because life so. is difficult, no matter, I mean, you, you've seldomly, if ever, ever met someone that said life is just completely easy and there's no troubles, right? And so what it seems to be is we come onto this into this world completely enlightened, without words or knowledge, but we're completely open. We have a very uh, incredible um, connection uh, to uh, pure consciousness, and mm -hmm. then it starts. The we, we come in as a complete puzzle, and the dismantling begins. Whether it's not getting our needs met or suffering a trauma, I mean, I, I wrote the calculations down. I calculated how many hours we're awake each year, and then I did the math, and I said over the twenty formative years of your life, you have this number of hours. I forgot the math, but it's a lot. Mm -hmm. You have this number of hours to be awake for something to go wrong that will shape you in a negative way. It's almost mm -hmm. important. It's impossible for anyone to leave their childhood unscathed or covered up where, where they, where they, they lose the connection to the one, which is you're inside the game. He uses the Twitter metaphor, Donald Hoffman. Um, he says, you know, look at all these, Agents of consciousness, they're typing, they're, they're messaging, they're, they're, they're posting stuff, but they're not posting it into the ether of space. They're posting it on Twitter. That's the platform. Mm -hmm. So the universe itself or consciousness itself is the, is the common consciousness that we're all 
uploading information to. And we, we can't make it like we know why it's happening. This doesn't explain, well, who created the virtual headset? Like if we're all wearing a virtual right. headset, what created it? That's, that, that's not even being touched on. We're, we're really just talking about a new frontier in science that's emerging. It's, it really is a renaissance going from the idea that space-time creates consciousness, which is 99% of the physicists Believe think that, that way. For sure. The idea that <clears throat> consciousness creates space-time. And you heard it here first on Good Sugar, ladies and gentlemen. Well, unless you were watching Donald Hoffman. But well, yeah. they don't know that yet. They don't know that. <laughs> I, I, think, but, I think we listened to, to, there's better clips that we should listen are to. There another, is there another clip or is it just that clip? I don't know what we're doing. You no, know, Brian was right. This guy doesn't talk in five-minute blurbs. So Brian was really smart. He picked something where there was like a hard stop. Otherwise, okay, or else he'd be going for hours. Going long. But I really want you to hear, I, I, I'm begging Brian, I really want you to hear him talking about the headset theory mm -hmm. because it's really interesting well is there, is there another clip brian consciousness is fundamental and space-time is just an interface and our bodies are merely icons that we use to represent interactions of conscious agents then on that approach there is the possibility that some aspect of my consciousness survives death it may be for example that the bare awareness that's associated with me just awareness without content that that survives but all the details of donald hoffman and his life story within this interface maybe that all dissolves if con i'm not against so again by the way i thought he would be saying things that i would find harder to swallow you know i think he does in some in some of the stuff he gets into the math and uh, you know, it it he it brings up all the stuff that you talk about, string theory, right. uh, quarks, neurons, all those little it science. It's probably things. hard to dissolve that into a you know dilute that rather to a minute. So I get it. No, it's not, and and it's not the nature of our show. But right. you know, uh, there's a guy. But I would say this, Marcus. I'm going to interrupt you. I would say send me one of the ones that move you the most, and on my next long run, I will listen to it while I run because that's when I list the most podcasts. I like it. I I just ask you to. Try to listen to it two times fully. Okay. I think you'll get it in, in, in two times. Well, I'll tell you this. I hope those that listen to this episode maybe got enlightened a little bit and will also seek out Donald Hoffman because uh, he seems like a fascinating dude. I do enjoy, Marcus, that you're always trying to further your mind and in turn bringing that knowledge to the rest of us. Nothing? No response? You know, Thank you. Know. <laughs> All right, listen, follow me over at... I was digesting, uh, sorry. Uh, follow me over at I Am Ralph Sutton. My other podcast is called The SDR Show. Uh, doing quite well lately. A lot of big guests coming on. And uh, we got some crazy things happening in the near future, which I'll fill you in as we get closer. Don't forget, by the way, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to join us, we are doing the Spartan Run in the end of April. So already like half the, good the, half the uh, guest digital staff wants to do it. I had about a dozen people hit me up on uh, Instagram that want to do it. So I would like us all, I will get, what we'll do is we'll find out the exact date, Brian, and we'll put it in the show notes. And if you want to be on board, email, DM me rather, just DM me on Instagram or DM Marcus on Instagram and say you want in on that run because that's going to be a fun one when we all do it at City Field. I believe it's end of April off the top of my head. The Good Sugar Store is on 3rd Avenue and 69th Street. If you had been there once before, you would have gotten that fifty percent off discount code. How long is that good for, Marcus? Just this I was weekend? just I was just between eight and eleven a.m. this morning. It's a oh, that's you know, it. Oh, that's okay. It. it was one day only. Well, that's, that's good. Come on, wake up. It's the nineties. It, it is the nineties. All right. So we'll see everyone next time on the Good Sugar Podcast.